So thank you very much for coming to this event, Why Are We Socialist Feminists? And this is the first in a series of events on this topic that the World Transform Momentum are going to be putting together. So keep your eye out. Um, I think um, we'll hear a bit more about that later, but keep your eye out for some of those future events. My name is Maya Goodfellow, um, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm uh, going to be chairing this really, really excellent panel tonight. And so before we get started, I just want to let you know how it's going to be structured. So the event is going to run for um, 90 minutes. Um, I'm going to give you a very quick overview of some of the general themes that we might touch upon this evening before introducing our really excellent panel. We're going to hear from each of them for around three to four minutes. Um, they're going to explain why they're here and specifically um, what socialist feminism means to them. And then for the real chunk of the, um, the session, for about an hour, we're going to having, be having a discussion among the panellists and they're going to be talking about the shape of contemporary feminism and what an inclusive socialist feminism movement might look like today. But before I um, get on to introducing our really, really excellent panel, just to give you a bit of an idea about maybe what this event is partly about. And so part of the reason we're having this session is to think about um, why socialism must be feminist and feminism must be socialist. And this is really crucial, I think, because it is women and non-binary people who are bearing the brunt of the fallout from late stage capitalism, whether that be from the climate catastrophe or the COVID crisis or austerity. And so we really need to think about how this impacts, these different crises impact people differently. In particular, how it impacts working class women, women of color, migrant women, disabled women, trans women, and non-binary people who are often disproportionately impacted when we're looking at these different crises. Too often though, despite the realities of who is affected, too often is marginalized people who are overlooked in the mainstream debate, but also in some of left-wing discussions around feminism um, and uh, what, what feminism means. So what exactly do we mean by this, thinking about margin, marginalized people and why, why, why it is that this must be central to our feminism? Just to give you a few examples before we get started, if you look at the domestic abuse bill that is moving through parliament at the moment, this has been lauded as one of a once in a lifetime opportunity to ensure that there are proper protections for survivors of domestic abuse. But if you look at the legislation, at least one group that are, left, uh, are being left out are migrant women. And this is even though, so they are left out of this domestic abuse um, legislation, even though they are pe the people who are some of the people most likely to be turned away from refuges because they have no recourse to public funds. It's also working class women of color who've been disproportionately impacted by austerity, while 35% of disabled women and 30% 30, 30 of disabled men are paid below the national living wage in the UK. At the same time, 42% of trans people um, are not living um, permanently in their preferred gender roles. They're prevented from doing so because they fear it might threaten their employment status. And so when we talk about in intersectional feminism, it's thinking about all of these different people within our fem within our feminism. Because even though many of these people are the, are the ones that are most impacted, they are also some of the people who are at the forefront of resistance. And we're going to touch upon that a bit tonight. This, they're the people who are organizing at the grassroots in our workplaces and in our communities, whether that be resisting austerity or whether that be trying to create a better social contract because of uh, the coronavirus. So in this session, we'll talk about what it means really to have a coherent, inclusive feminist movement and ask ourselves, do we really have that in the UK and beyond? And if not, what might that look like? So these are some of the some of the themes that I hope we're going to touch on tonight. And joining us to discuss um, this and many, many other issues, uh, we have a really, really excellent panel, as I said. And so I'm going to introduce each of them before we go and hear from their um, three to four minute interventions. So first up, we have Bel Rabiru Adi, who is the MP for Streatham and member of the Socialist Campaign Group. We have Iggy Moon, who is a senior lecturer at Roehampton University and winner of the GLAAD David Harvey Award of 2019. Hilary Wainwright, who is the co-editor of Red Pepper magazine and author of Beyond the Fragments. Solma Ahmed, who is Momentum National Coordinating Group member um, and experienced campaigner for the rights of migrant women and the Labour National Women's Committee candidate. Shardine Taylor Stone, who is here in a personal capacity, is a writer, activist, educator, and trade unionist, and is currently writing her first book on the neoliberalization of black feminism. 
and Jess Barnard, who is Chair of Young Labour, County Councillor for Nelson Ward in Norwich and a youth work worker. So if we were all in the same room together, then I would ask you to give a round of applause to welcome our panelists. But since we're not, that a uh, virtual one will have to do. Um, and firstly, I will pass over to Shardine, who's gonna give her three to four minute intervention on why she is a socialist feminist. Thank you, Mayor, for that introduction. And um, it's an honour and a privilege to be on this panel with such amazing women. So the question was, um, what socialist feminism means to me or why am I a socialist feminist? And um, I mean, the most obvious answer is why not? Um, you know, for to be a feminist means we, uh, it's a necessity to have a liberationary, liberationary framework. And that means having a sort of end goal to what we're working towards to dismantle the system that we're in. So I just wanted to put that out there, but I actually, um, on a, I was asked to bring like a sort of a personal anecdote to this. And I find like the best writing on why I am personally a socialist feminist has actually already been written and out there um, by the Combahee River Collective um, statement in 1977. And the Combahee River Collective was a collective of black feminist women who'd grown out of the um, general women's movement on the se second wave. And it included people like Angela Davis, Audrey Lord, amongst others. And um, I just wanted to read um, what it is that they said that their statement was about as black women, as feminists and as socialists, because I think that articulates everything that I would ever say in my own introduction. Um, so they say, we realise that the liberation of all oppressed peoples necessita necessitates the destruction of the political economic systems of capitalism and imperialism as well as patriarchy. We are socialists because we believe that work must be organised for the collective benefit of those who do the work and create the products and not for the profit of the bosses. Material resources must be equally distributed among those who create these resources. We are not convinced, however, that a socialist revolution that is not also a feminist and anti-racist revolution will guarantee our liberation. And they continue to say, we need to articulate the real class situation of persons who are not merely raceless sexist workers, but for whom racial and sexual oppression are significant determinants in their working and economic lives. And I don't think anything could really articulate better why I am a socialist feminist. And I still adhere to those principles. And what I would really like to see in this conversation is how us as socialist um, feminists push the left, I guess, really, to actually really kind of bring in feminism as central to what it is that we're doing, not as something that's other. Often we have um, feminism or racism as something else that's not connected to workers. And it's actually bringing that in and making sure that we are working within a framework which is anti-patriarchy from the get-go. So that's my intro and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shardine. I think that's a really important recognizing um, the work that's already been done and the work that we can build upon um, and learn from. I think that's a really important intervention and also thank you for keeping to time, which is not something that everyone always does. Um, okay, next up is Iggy, so over to you, Iggy. Hi, everybody, thanks for uh, um, watching us and listening to us. I think it's a really fantastic event to have. Uh, why am I a socialist feminist? Um, well, again, why not? Uh, I suppose if I look now at my history and experience, um, what I thought was feminism in the 1970s and 80s and 90s for me um, has taken a new shape. Um, I think that the second wave feminist movement was something that left a fantastic uh, legacy of its time, but things did move on and we desperately needed an intersectional framework and we needed that through Kimberly Crenshaw's work and we were offered that and we took hold of that because black women were not being included and were not given a mouthpiece uh, in order to be able to add 
the importance of uh, a different vision for a future more livable, as, as Judith Butler would say, a livable life. Um, and feminism, I also believe, from that intersectional perspective, has led to a feminism that I, I think uh, Kayoma and Sandy Stone advocate, which is a trans feminism, and a trans feminism which is arguing that we all, as feminists, stand together and that we allow people to live the life that, they, that we all believe uh, should actually be uh, livable that no one has a right to turn around and say, you are not this and you are not that, and that somehow what I hear now is a hostility. And I think there's an affective role to think about in all this. I think going back to 1979 with Arlie Hochschild's work around emotional labour, uh, that women carry an emotional labour and that the affective politics of our everyday life need to be assessed in light of what we mean by socialism. That for me, being uh, an advocate of trans feminism and feminism has been a uh, a part of my life i've spent 40 years fighting different causes and i will carry on but it is an emotional labor that i think we have to um we have to recognize and that really right now uh there is more hostility now to the trans community than i've ever ever heard before. Uh, I heard it back in the 80s against uh, the lesbian and gay movement uh, and there were splits in the lesbian movement and lesbian feminism but certainly at the moment these rather um, really dreadful statements are not in keeping with what the, the, what I know as feminism and I reject any form of feminism that, in, 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 that instead looks at division rather than Co collectivity, because I do not believe that a social justice agenda that is embedded within um, our socialist politics, uh, where we wish to promote the idea of um, how we as a society and as individuals live within a collective and an effective world, one where kindness and the way that we wish to live a livable life um, allows us to work together that we don't need the culture war approach as it is at the moment, the idea of dividing people, of, as Maya said, not including migrants. I've just been fighting for a, a conversion therapy ban, and um, I'm, I'm aware that we're trying to argue why trans should be included. Uh, why am I arguing this in 2021? Why are we asking some of the questions that we're asking? Uh, because basically we need to still move forward. Uh, for me, a critical humanist approach, one that brings together uh, the individual and society uh, in searching out a better, more socially just society is one that I think all feminists uh, wish to be a part of and that I would certainly uh, want to support. That's probably it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Iggy. I was furiously nodding as you were talking. Um, and I think that, yeah, this is a really, really important point that really we can't, um, we really shouldn't ignore given the huge facility and huge amounts of attacks that trans um, people generally are facing in the UK at the moment. I mean, it's a very particular case in the UK, particularly bad here. It is really, really incumbent upon all of us to stand up for trans rights and ensure that our feminism is trans inclusory. And so thank you very much for, for that intervention. Um, next up, we have Selma. So over to you, Selma. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to hear two other women before um, you know, I start mine. Um, and great to be here with uh, you know, so, so many wonderful women tonight. Um, my background is housing. I'm a housing practitioner, you could say, and um, I've worked in housing all my life. And, and through housing, I realized I was a socialist and I was a fighter for women's rights. I worked primarily with migrant women and refugee women in Tower Hamlets. This is where I saw the real suffering of women, whether it is poverty, lack of education or violence and abuse from their partners. This is where I decided that I and my organization that I worked for will prioritize women 
starting with our allocation policy to finding plumbers, electricians, and women architects team. I hope as discussion goes forward, I can tell you more about how I pioneered some of those works. I have many stories to tell you. But tonight, what I want to do, I want to um, concentrate on my one of my current project and, and why I'm helping this woman organization in, in Colchester. I moved back to Colchester about five years ago from London. And there is a small BME community in Colchester. Many of them are from the Bangladeshi community. And, you know, I'm from Bangladesh uh, originally as well. A small Bangladeshi women's group have been struggling in Colchester for the past 10 years. And, and they've been doing some works informally. And, and this organization is primarily made up of, you know, taxi drivers, wives of taxi drivers and restaurant workers. And they were struggling to find their voice in the majority white area like Colchester. So of course, with my experience gained in Tar Hamlers and my enthusiasm for anything to do with women's uh, group or women's cause, they called me up to help out. So I decided first of all, I will, what I will do is register that organization into a community interest company. And then I would, you know, set some structures and rules for that organization. Secondly, you know, and that's one of the things I love doing is taking other women, you know, trying to empower them to speak for themselves. So I took a couple of those women to meetings and events, and I've done that throughout my working life, is I take these women who can't find their voice and, 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 and try to build them up in terms of in terms of finding their voice, in terms of getting the uh, confidence that they need. So guess what? You know, after a couple of months, they said, oh, Solma, can you organize a swimming session for us? You know, and um, I thought, oh, that's easy. You know, I'll go to uh, the, the local sports center and say, look, you know, let's have a, a session for women only. But no, it was more difficult than, uh, than working in Taha Hamlets when we first started talking about domestic violence amongst the Bangladeshi and Somali community. It took me about 18 months to negotiate with the council to get a swimming started in, in, in local swimming pools, local leisure center. And that was only once a fortnight session for an hour, but it took 18 months. 18 months of some of the women actually protesting outside the swimming pool. Uh, you know, hijabi women, have you seen hijabi women protesting outside a swimming pool? Well, they did. Then of course, COVID-19 happened. And, and these women who are already isolated and many of them suffer from mental health issues. And we know this COVID have shown how disproportionately um, uh, the women affected are from working class and BME communities. I sometimes think we have to start from zero again because it has put back all the good work we did in the 1980s. Anyway, that, that, that project suddenly, about four months ago, we had an opportunity to bid for an NHS funding. NHS invited us to the meeting and at the first meeting I said look this this is funding specifically for BME communities and BME women now I will only apply for this funding if you give that funding directly to the BME organization I do not want this funding to go through another mainstream organization because you see in Tar Hamlets what I learned is funding comes in my name and in my community name. And what happens? Imperialist and neoliberal attitude says it can't be given to BME organization right directly to help themselves. Well, I'm happy to tell you today 
that Bangladeshi Women Association is one of the shortlisted project put forward by NHS to get a significant amount of funding to deliver the health project over two years. So you see, with my experience, I have learned to say no to crumbs of the table. And then I suppose this is how I became a socialist because I saw the suffering and I became a feminist. Now, one of my first um, launch that happened recently on the, for the Women's Committee, there were comment on Twitter, says, Muslim women and feminists don't go together. And I said to them, well, look at me, look at thousands of other Muslim women who are fighting for feminism and who are fighting for socialism. So I look forward to, you know, talking some more about the things that we have done, I have done uh, in terms of, you know, empowering women and giving a women voice and women's right. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I can see a lot of people in the comments saying it's really um, important in, uh, to hear the kind of work that you've been doing and lots of people saying it's really inspiring to, to hear you uh, talk about this kind of resistance. And I'm also really sorry that you have to encounter this kind of Islamophobia. And it's really, it, this is why it's incredibly important that we make sure when we're talking about inclusivity, we are thinking about how different people are being impacted by these um, really by by the, this kind of bigotry and so yeah it's really inspiring to hear you the, the work that you've been doing um over the years so thank you for that um okay next up we are going to hear from jess so over to you jess thanks maya um yeah thanks for the introduction uh, my name is jess barnard i am the um, current chair of young labor um currently living in norwich um and yeah, I was asked to give also, you know, a, a similar like personal perspective as to as to why I became a, a socialist feminist. And I think for me, like a lot of working class uh, young people, my my politics, you know, didn't come from my parents, didn't come from kind of my education. It came from the experiences that I was surrounded by um, and my relationship to people who exploited their positions of power. And I think my experience with firsthand with gender, sexuality and class and how they're all intertwined as forms of oppression. And I think the first time that sticks out to me as thinking we really need, a, you know, organized liberation, feminist, socialist movement was when I was a teenager working in, in retail in a non-unionized company in a workplace, um, experiencing multiple instances of sexual harassment and seeing my peers experience the same thing and realizing that I had no one to go to and that I was part of a system that was completely rigged against working class women ever being able to achieve justice in while the structures exist and realizing that society is entirely preoccupied with the profits and protecting the people that enable those profits over the protections of, of working class women and people like myself. Um, and I went on to become a, a youth worker um, in the following years and I only further embedded my belief that this system, this capitalist system is, is corrupt to its core and that our feminism must be a socialist one for it to transform the lives of, of people that are oppressed by it. Um, I started my career as a youth worker, mostly delivering mental health support to young people who are either facing homelessness, uh, facing um, struggles with home or um, on the cusp of being um, excluded from their education system. And I found increasingly that, that young people were at a crisis point um, caused by austerity and cuts to the services that they depend on um, and their communities being affected by it similarly. You know, and, and looking at the statistics, you could, you could see it happening in front of you, like excluded children being seven times more likely to end up in prison, just being failed time and time and time again by the systems that should have existed to support them. Young women of colour facing racism at school, but teachers completely unequipped to deal with it um, and, and complaining of lack of resources and lack of funding and lack of support to be able to have the structures in place to address this. Trans young people facing huge levels of prejudice um, and now trans young people recently being barred from accessing transitional health care um, because of you know, the decisions of 
um, this conservative government also disabled young people facing huge cuts to services and being put on unlivably low um, incomes. And alongside all of this, all of this, is, you know, has, has created a mental health crisis amongst young people. And in Norfolk, we have reached a point where young people are often left for up to 18 months from the point of referral to being seen and being able to access support. So time and time again, we're seeing that this system is completely rigged against people like us. And austerity has hit marginalised women the hardest. And we've seen the COVID crisis has only exacerbated the existing inequalities. So over time working in this sector, I've worked to develop um, a political education program, um, campaigning tools and techniques and participation youth work to try to fight back against this system and ensure that when we talk about holistic provision in terms of services, we make sure that that includes working hand in hand with young people to try to address the root cause of the injustices that they face, not just plastering over the top, but making sure that we understand that these are systematic oppressions that they're facing and that we do everything we can to equip them to fight with us shoulder to shoulder to address it. So I think socialist feminism is important in creating solidarity among all marginalised groups who are similarly exploited by these structures. And in my role as chair of Young Labour, I think this requires building a bold and diverse socialist movement that is energized to fight for this change um, and earlier i just end with um, i think that shardine articulated perfectly the need for us to ensure that feminism is not an other or an afterthought when we're talking about socialism and we also need to abandon the assumptions that are often made that the left is an automatically feminist or safe space we have a huge amount of educating and organizing to do and i think that that has to start with solidarity within our own ranks Thank you so much for that, Jess. Um, another really, really important um, intervention, I think. And in particular, I think the, the you know the experiences that you talk about of working um, in retail is something a lot of us, I think, will probably be able to identify with. And really, this is a huge part of the um, the economy that just goes it so often goes overlooked in terms of the low levels of unionisation, the l lack of rights, and that it's often younger people in these positions. Um, with very, very little means to sort of challenge the, exactly as you said, to challenge the um, the people who are in charge and who are able to do something about the forms of exploitation that are going on. So thank you for that. Um, next, we will hear from Hilary. So Hilary, over to you. Okay, well, firstly, thanks so much for this meeting. I, I hope it's the beginnings of a socialist feminist movement. I mean, that's something to discuss in the in the discussion, but I think we need it. I mean, as Jess said, COVID's revealed how, you know, actually it's working class women who are, you know, most affected uh, by the crisis. I mean, even the Financial Times today had a, a report saying exactly that, that working women have been the people most um, most of them badly affected. So the need for a socialist feminist movement is, is really crucial. But to build on, on what Jess ended up with about the importance of, 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 of feminism within our own ranks, within, within the left, that's in a way how I became a feminist in the, um, in 68, which was obviously a very, you know, um, inspiring time for socialists. But, um, in a way, women felt sort of uneasy. Um, and I'll just mention this poster that appeared in Paris where it said student. I mean, socialism in 68 was very critical and questioning, you know. So um, anyway, this poster said student who questions everything, the relations of the worker to the employer, the relations of the pupil to the teacher. Have you questioned the relations of man to women, to woman? Girl students who take part in the revolution don't be duped again, do not follow others, define your own demands. And it was that sort of feeling of needing to needing to define our own demands as women and, and needing the space to do that. Because in a way, as a result of our subordination, we, we kind of didn't know our demands. We just felt a sort of unease uh, and, a, and a kind of secondariness. Um, and so in a, a way, the women's movement for me was a, a key thing about it, which I think can influence our socialism, was the way it combined 
a, a need for personal change and personal transformation and personal consciousness raising, as we called it, with the building of a collective movement. Because in a way, we recognise that though we faced structures of oppression, which I'll come to in a minute, we also faced a kind of self-containment, a complicity yeah, due to our own consciousness in a way. And we needed to collectively change that consciousness and create alternatives in the here and now. So a lot of, you know, socialist comrades, as it were, would say, or so-called comrades, would say, well, feminism, that's something for later. That's for after the revolution, after we get a, a, a left government or, or whatever, just always sort of procrastinating. And the thing about feminism that's, I think, important, not just for for, for women, but for, for, for people of colour, for working class people, is we need change now. We need change now that is also enabling and empowering us to, to, to fight for total transformation. So that combination of personal liberation with collective, the co a collective movement that enables that personal liberation to be sustained was, was the first point that struck me as important. The second one was um, the idea that, as, as, as Shadeen has, has stressed, and, and um, I think just about everybody, um, we can't achieve that liberation without a, a total economic transformation. And in a way, that's where the sort of relevance of Marxism was, was so important. And in a way, that led, um, that led me and many other feminists to see class as not counterposed to gender or to race, that, that class was lived in a gendered and a racialized way. And the, the material structures of patriarchy and racism and of class exploitation were interconnected. So that in a way, intersectionalism is is kind of in the nature of the enemy and we have to be intersectional too uh, if we're to fight that material basis of our oppression and finally we were very i mean i, I think that the, the second wave feminism had huge limits and in a way we were very self-conscious and generally self-critical of both the limits and the nature of the movement we had to build so we always felt that the movement depended on us. It wasn't some external structure. You know, it wasn't institutions and rules. It was us and the quality of our relationships between each other. And so the idea of building a powerful movement had to be building a, a movement that was inclusive, as ego stressed, uh, and a movement that was listening and opening, open to people. So we always stressed the importance of, of listening to each other, of 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 discussion, of, of care for each other. And I think that sort of principle is crucial for rebuilding the left. But I think that we need for that rebuilding of the left a really strong socialist feminist movement. And I think we need that now more than ever. So thanks. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much for that, Hilary. I think that's a really important um, perspective to bring in thinking about you know some of those lessons that can be learned um from struggles that have been fought in the past so yeah thank you um okay finally we will hear from bell thank you anna thank you very much for inviting me to this um very very important event this evening uh why i'm a socialist feminist i think because i don't have a choice um if i want to see uh, equality uh, for women in the way that I believe it should be, that is that is what I have to be, a socialist feminist. And socialism for me means equality to me as a person and feminism means equality to me as a, a woman. And not all people who say they're socialists are feminists and not all people who came to be feminists are socialists. Far too often those that advocate socialism kind of descend into a, a workerist, uh, white workerist type of view that talks about um, um, black people and other ethnic minorities uh, and, and kind of divides our communities in that way as the other. And, you know, people want to talk about working class communities and black communities and dividing them that way because um, we're seeing with 80% of black, Asian and ethnic minority communities living in the poorest areas of the country. This means that they are the working classes. So those reductionist arguments looking at things through one prism or the other uh, doesn't always really work, saying that we can only focus on one issue and not not the other. And I'm an MP. Uh, people talk to me about tactics and and concessions 
Uh, but being a socialist feminist to me is about not conceding and not buying into the idea that in order to get to the top one day and to make the changes that need to be made, I need to step on my sister's head or be complicit in passing or blocking legislation um, that impacts women's uh, lives here or abroad. And, and that's why at seven o'clock, I'm going to leave you briefly uh, to vote against the government's disgraceful budget, which in every uh, single way, like the past 10 years of austerity, will will have such a negative impact on women, just like their whole economic package during uh, the pandemic has been. Now, uh, we fought for equality, and even though it is the law, it just seems that at the moment it's completely expendable. And when um, you know, equality should be at the front and centre of, of every single policy that we're making. We're just seeing it pushed aside um, and, and not even considered, not even assessed. And, and, and finally, being a socialist feminist to me means, um, you know, working intersectionally and, and being inclusive. Uh, I know that some black women in the past have referred to being a womanist uh, as opposed to a feminist and not because they didn't believe in the liberation of all women or they didn't subscribe to all of those ideals because the feminist movement for far too often excluded them. But today I would argue that any woman who claims to be a feminist and doesn't see that racism is one of um, the, the, the most key issues facing women right across the world, I think they are the ones that should perhaps consider what to call their activism, um, not me uh, or, or not other, uh, other black women who also subscribe to, to, to feminism. If the feminist movement is truly a global movement, um, then you know people need to consider who they're truly advocating for and whether or not that is ab about the, the global uh, liberation of women. Um, and and you know that definitely to me also holds a very very important internationalist um, um, you know section to it in terms of being a socialist feminist. So so, so that would be um, why I'm a socialist feminist. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Belle. And I, I think that that's a, this is a really, really important point about thinking about, we're not just thinking about the national, we are thinking about the international and race is absolutely central. Just as um, you shouldn't have socialism without feminism, how can we have feminism that doesn't center anti-racism and this shouldn't be peripheral, it should be central to the way that we're understanding our struggles. So thank you very much for that. And um, Yes, we'll let you off. We're going to have to vote against the budget. That's, uh, I think that's a good, good very good reason to um, have to pop out. So um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, now we're gonna move to discussion with all of the panelists. Um, so we, we have around, um, we have around 50 minutes for this. So hopefully this will allow for some really good um, discussion. And um, just to get us started, uh, I, I first wanted to, I guess, address this to Hilary, Bell and Iggy, thinking about, um, we just had International Women's Day yesterday, um, and I think it allows for some, whilst in some ways this has sort of been uh, hijacked, as it's become corporatized in lots of ways, I think it also allows us to reflect on actually some of the um, achievements of the feminist movement and think about some of the histories that you touched upon. And so, um, asking the three of you, what do you what do you see as some of the key achievements of the feminist movement that maybe we can learn learn from as well as build upon? Maybe I will um, come first to um, Bell. I'll come first to you if that's okay, and then anyone else who wants to jump in, please do so. Uh, I would say true representation. That's definitely one of the um, the the, the, the pluses of the, of the feminist movement. We've had a situation where there are now more women um, in positions of, of, of power and having those women's positions of power has made a difference. Now, when I say that, I do want to make absolutely clear that I do not believe that representation is, 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 is the end game in that, oh, as long as we've got women in positions of power, that's going to change issues for women because we can see that there are times when women do get into positions of power that it can actually have the complete opposite effect but where it has made a difference I think that's definitely something we can celebrate. Yeah absolutely um, understanding the limits of that representation is maybe something we will talk about in a moment but yes recognizing I think that um, 
this has been one in some instances through struggle, I think is really important. Hilary and Iggy, did you have anything you wanted to add in terms of really thinking about, you know, what are some of these key achievements? Um, or, you know, what more do we have to do? It's something that I think all of you sort of touched upon, but maybe a bit more space to think about. Um, I could add one or two things. So um, I think two other things. Um, it, one is within the movement. I think that, um, and this is like a limit and a, an achievement, I think amongst younger men particularly, but not, you know, not, not all of them, <laughs> there's a, a recognition of the need to change the the way in which relationships are built in the in the in in the left and in the trade union movement. So a greater sensitivity to domination and um, exclusion and um, sort of speak, you know, over kind of silencing um, women and each other. Um, in 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 meetings in the movement so there's a a, a more um i don't know you call it feminist but there is a um i call it feminist sort of sensitivity that's at least percolated through amongst younger men in my experience and but i think on the other hand it's a sort of limit that actually there's still a, a large number of, of 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 men in the in the, on the left who simply see feminism in terms of you know adding on I think somebody else talked about this sort of that feminism is a sort of add-on and so we've still got some way to go to really feminize politics and then for another thing I think I mean in general I don't well I wouldn't say we've achieved a huge amount but the other thing that we've done I think is 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 focus people are more alert to domestic labor you know in the past the work of of child care of of housework and so on was entirely privatized and now it's it's a bit more the subject of of public debate i mean even this this article in the ft you know the financial times was sort of surveying you know the 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 amount of domestic labor that women are doing compared to men i mean that's been around for a bit but i just think we've helped to make that private domestic labor a political question yeah thanks for that I I did, you, did you want to add anything oh you're muted okay sorry about this um i think two areas that for me i one um around language i think uh, i was thinking about what hillary is just saying but i do think that language is changing in the sense of a more so, uh, the, the idea of subjectivity the idea of what constitutes uh, one's presence as uh, a woman uh, or a man and i think that that's why the present hostility is rather um crude this idea of what constitutes a real woman or a real man i find that really almost quite dated i think that these are very very uh complex debates uh, while at the same time uh, we don't you know the language of what's of of feminism uh, certainly third wave feminism and trans feminism is really thinking about language the idea of you know what does it mean uh, we might never have thought at one point of what it means to incarcerate people now this politics of incarceration of recognition of 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 what things are beginning to mean in a socially just world is one thing i also think that you know uh, th this idea of emotional labour and uh, how it attaches itself to reproductive rights is really very important. You know that whether we, uh, we, th the idea of what we might mean uh, about being uh, or doing uh, uh, femininity, uh, being a female. What does it mean in terms of body and um, the way that we have 
uh, the rights in this world. I was talking about trans pregnancy yesterday and the way, you know, uh, it, there's a real need at the moment for us to focus, really drill down on the language of our legal system and our jurisdiction because some of it is very, very dated and is, is actually rather than liberating people, is holding people in a position that is no longer uh, going to help them to live their life in a way that they want. So language and for me, some of this around reproduction has, has really helped to develop, but there is much further to go yet. Uh, and, and I think actually it's, it's uh, we've got some good debates to have. Oh, yes, Shardine, do you want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to come in and um, absolutely thank you um, both for those really brilliant um interventions there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of achievements, I think it is really important for us to actually recognise the achievements of those that have gone before us. Um, sometimes I think that can be um, looked over and we end up in this sort of generational conflict and, um, you know, looking at ways where we can actually, I guess, improve and move on from what we've learned um, from the past and also what people are doing now. So, you know, I was watching a um, really brilliant um, documentary um, about the Yorkshire Ripper that was made by a feminist filmmaker, which I think is still on BBC. And um, just seeing the depiction of um, sexism in the 1970s and just how awful and atrocious that it was. And, in you know, just being grateful for some of the women that stood up during that time and uh, made a point about, um, you know, why should women be being put on a curfew? What about men? All of that kind of stuff. And just things about, you know, the types of work that women can do, um, some of the legislation changing around, so like rape in marriage as well, being legislated against, and also um, just general kind of women's services, um, support systems for women who like, experience violence and things like that. And, you know, if we look back at, you know, the 50s and the 60s, a lot of this stuff just wasn't around. Um, so I think it's important for us to recognise those achievements, but then we also do need to do more, um, particularly around issues around trans rights, um, domestic labour, um, the sort of um, women of colour, black women in particular, having um, the sort of gig economy, precarious contracts, those sorts of things. And I think that's the kind of conversations that we're moving towards to now in the modern feminist movement. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Shardine. And I think, yeah, recognizing some of those um, important wins, uh, I think, is also important to sort of keep the struggle going. Because if you feel like nothing's changed, sometimes it's like, why bother to do anything at all if we were always just losing these fights? And I think one um, sort of relatively recent win is the um, the organization Level Up campaigning um, for better reporting and sort of press guidelines around reporting of um, women killed by by domestic violence. These kinds of changes are really, really important in the kind of the, the culture that I suppose we consume and how we understand some of these issues. Um, Salma, to, to bring you in as well, did you want to speak to this, this question around achievements? Yes, um, I just wanted to say, I mean, uh, you know, all the good things been said already, um, but what bothering me about the achievements um, lately is uh, is what, uh, what what austerity and the covid-19 has done to all the achievement you know some of the achievements that people talked about it and uh, and you know for me who you know worked in grassroots um in terms of you know education health and employment and i'm i just feel you know I just feel that we we have to restart again on some of those basic things that we we did, uh, uh, basic things that we pioneered. Uh, for example, you know, girls' education in in Tar Hamlets, where we established fast homework session, and and you know those sort of thing. I I I think, you know, this this austerity and the COVID has has 
uh, put us back into what it was like 1980s, uh, especially you know when you have to work with migrant women and and, and refugee women, and um, and I, I really think we need to consider that aspects. You know, even if you look at the far low, you know how many women are affected by far low and uh, and low paid job. So you know, I'm thinking in my head, my God, you know, I have to do the same thing, perhaps you know, with, with BME and migrant women that I did in the 80s, so that, you know, they, they are, you know, brought back to what they're supposed to do, play their part in society and deal with, you know, the, the, the capitalism uh, and, and, and through capitalism that they, they, they were oppressed. And, and, and they were oppressed through through austerity they were oppressed through covid 19 so I, I really think we need to consider some of those aspects as we move forward yeah thank you for that that's, that's really important um i suppose thinking about um where i get maybe what we might call liberal feminism or mainstream feminism where that's at i wonder um maybe for shardine jess bell what do you uh, how do you see this as sort of maybe undermining or, or being a, a sort of barrier in a way for, for the kind of organizing that we've been talking about? And I suppose like a, a good example of that is um, thinking about how people like Margaret Thatcher, Theresa May, Priti Patel are sort of held up as, you know, these are women. It's sort of what you touched on before, Belle, like the the, the negatives or the problems of, of representation being the entirety of the politics. How much do you see that is undermining our kind the kind of organizing we've been speaking about? And um, I mean, what do we do about it as well? If you have if you have a solution, then that would be that would also be um, great. Um, maybe Jess, if if I come to you, is that all right? Yeah. Sure. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Great. Um, yeah, completely. Uh, and the I guess the phrase that springs to mind, and I think it's kind of letting them off easy, is like that girl boss feminism that we see like a, quite a lot of on the internet at the moment um and it's you know pretty consistently like middle class white women feminism um that what well, you know isn't really feminism it's it's not concerned with equality or with redistribution of wealth and power or ending misogyny or addressing all of the structures that we've already talked about that exploit women um and like the kind of feminism that they they champion, you know, it just isn't concerned with dismantling those structures. Um, and, you know, least of all intersectional feminism. So I think they really reduce feminism to this kind of cheerleading of like women, um, regardless of what their track records are or what their commitments to women are. A really prime example that springs to my mind is like, the huge numbers of, of middle class women who came out. Um, in support of Hillary Clinton as like a self-proclaimed like feminist movement, um, despite the fact that you know she has an appalling track record um, in her you know support for women's rights for sex workers, she completely threw them under the bus, um, and has supported hugely damaging policies for marginalised women and particularly like women of colour, the war on drugs, all of those kinds of policies that she was part of. Um, while these people completely dismissed people like Bernie Sanders, like Jeremy Corbyn, who may be men, but have a much greater understanding of feminism and a desire to address the structural inequalities that marginalised women face. Um, and also within that, there's this kind of complete lack of understanding of anti-imperial feminism. And I think um, Belle touched on it already, and it's something that they, you know, completely removed from the discussion. Um, around you know the the policies and the things that, that our governments pursue that drive thousands of women into refuge that, that exploit land and resources for profit and you know the the fatal consequences for people who are dependent on those resources um and the you know the discussion for peace and for justice have completely been left behind um for this kind of girl boss like media friendly um like palatable middle class feminism um so i think it is hugely hugely damaging to our movement and what we do about it is you know i think we have to start by um organizing again and educating again because i think a lot of people uh, naively fall into the trap of thinking that this is what feminism is and this is what it, this is what it looks like um and i think a lot of that comes from the absence of the the left 
um, putting its energy into organising um, as a feminist collective movement. Yeah, I think that point about it being a really widespread way of understanding sort of um, fighting for equality is is a real problem in terms of like if I just think about what my like social media feeds are filled with on International Women's Day. Um, I'm not just friends with people who are <laughs> signed up lefties, so it, it you see you know you do see um, you do see this kind of co more corporate feminism, I guess, and I think this is a real challenge. I don't know, Shardine or Bell, if you wanted to say a bit. Do you want to add anything to um to what um, Jess has said? I would actually. I mean, it's actually really amazing to have Jess as a sort of young Labour person saying this. It gives me so much joy to hear this from another generation because I apologise for us millennials because we've been terrible with this girl boss feminism. I'm so sorry. But um, you guys are tidying it up for us, so I'm really pleased about that. But um yeah, so it's just sort of, um, I think it's really important for us to actually look at this trajectory of um, how fe feminism is manifested today. And um, Thatcher was already, um, just mentioned Thatcher. And, you know, we need to sort of look at the kind of individualism that developed in that era and then how that was then reinforced again with new labour and, you know, that kind of the woman CEO and you know, all these sort of like women MPs that were sort of Blairites that were kind of placed in there as well and that what that meant and what that essentially created a culture of what a lot of people believed was um, a feminist win, essentially. So I try to be, you know, a bit sort of empathetic on, onto how, um, you know, a sort of new generation is actually reaching to the point of where they become socialists and how they become feminists because they're going through you know, 20, 30 years of, of a layer of um, neoliberalism, essentially. And um, also, you know, they're reacting to austerity and, you know, not being able to access work, um, well, permanent work, and being sort of forced to kind of um, become entrepreneurs in a way. So I think there's a, there's, a, there's a connection there, I think, to think about in terms of, how this type of liberal feminism is appealing to people because it sort of justifies that um, individualist, capitalist um, set of goals of which they've been taught since, you know, they were bab babbies, you know what I mean? So um, I think now what we are seeing, um, particularly post Corbyn and post this sort of new wave of feminism is actually people starting to kind of make the connections to um, feminism, their um, sort of material wealth, their circumstances, and starting to have a more structural approach. So I'm actually quite excited about how things are moving and I'm starting to see that change in conversation. And um, yeah, so I think that's um, something that we can all sort of create that atmosphere for sort of growth and political education in that way. Yeah, that's um, yeah. I think that that that's. I think understanding it sort of from an empathetic, um, taking an empathetic view of it is really important. And understanding that this these things are often born in a political and economic reality in which these kinds of the, the logic sort of makes sense to people. And it's about, I suppose, um, explaining there's another way of doing things. Um, Iggy, did you want to? Did you want to come in? Yeah, just very quickly. I mean, it just seems to me that, you know, my my sense is that at the moment there's a there's a rather sort of locker room feminist approach to, with some women who I don't think are socialists. They represent quite often a very, uh, actually maybe even more in the sort of like, um, certainly within academic uh, sort of uh, places where there's this sort of, we're going to put the world to rights, we're going to dictate what it is. Usually white women, maybe of a particular class, uh, uh, I'm not not necessarily able-bodied, but I do think that the, there is a, a there is this talk that goes on that decides how the rest of feminism should uh, look and that they are the feminists who are uh, the right sort of feminist and behind closed doors they have their agendas that actually are rather 
uh, destructive rather than reconstruct discourse it, they do these sort of um you know counter discourses that are really not not very useful for feminism uh, as such and uh, that's all i want to say i don't want to go on i'll shut i'll shut up now actually no thanks for that um yeah i think the, yeah I, I do think so beginning to critique the, these forms of feminism is an important step to towards creating a more inclusive for, form of socialist feminism but i suppose the other or another um another sort of barrier or thing to think about is something that i think everyone has um has touched on which is really thinking about who's being excluded or marginalized in feminist narratives and why but i th that was sort of the next question i had but there was actually a question in the chat that i think spoke to that quite well in a way that might, might allow us to think about it um in a slightly different way too which the question was how do we prevent feminism anti-racism um lbgt Q plus rights and disabled rights um, being dismissed as identity politics that cause more divisiveness. And I think that that's quite a, I think that's quite a useful and important question given where a lot of the mainstream debates are. How can we ensure that these things are not, th these, these thinking about, intersectionally thinking about feminism, I suppose, is not sort of dismissed um, as something that is just identity politics. Um, Salma, I don't know if you had any thoughts on this in terms of thinking about what do we do when people, this is how people are, are approaching when an intersectional approach is, is, is brought in, is, is, is centred and this is the kind of response. What do you think the best way to sort of engage with that or respond to it is? Best way to... Um respond and engage with that uh, I, I think is is dialogue you know you you really need to have that conversation um, sometimes it's very hard conversation but it it has to have that conversation happening um and uh, and and for example you know um in that whole feminism um socialist feminism and whole whole feminism debate um you know there are people like me that is excluded from from that narrative and and i think you know i i, I think it's, it's time that we 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 sort of uh, you know talk to each other engage with each other you know uh, uh and you know the, the the simplest way i could explain uh, is that uh, you know I've, I've touched it on earlier uh, is that when when you know my first launch to be on the women's committee was tweeted uh, i had uh, uh, comments you know and uh, comments like you know how can you be a muslim and a feminist you know i could be socialist but i can't be a feminist and uh, and uh, when when people look at my scarf for example you know they think i'm oppressed and i'm depressed and, and i'm doing it because my husband told me to you know but uh, you know they don't know my husband didn't want me to wear this headscarf i wore it because that's that's uh, you know uh, that's my identity you know later on in my life i felt i need to have an identity because you know i'm i'm losing that uh, in in this mainstream um sort of argument about about feminism about you know about uh, 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 us as muslim and and all this islamophobia that's going on so you know you 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 have to engage and you have to talk to uh, 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 talk to people that you don't like talking to uh, and and for, for uh, and, and the other example i would give you know transphobia and transgender you know uh, people people um, i know that uh, would say oh i sign up to equality i love equality i embrace equality but they don't know that equality means you you and you know you 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 embrace everything that equality gives you and and that's you know i uh, that's that's acknowledging you know people are different so you know we, we we just really need to have that hard conversation hard discussion and some of that could be political education as well so <laughs> this is all i have to say so yeah thank you for that and i think that that's a this is a really important point and hillary i wanted to come to you on this as well is 
And I wonder if, I mean, perhaps, I don't think these things do map onto each other entirely, but um, sometimes it feels like there can be a generational divide around some of these issues. And I, I really don't want to overstate that because I think it is more complicated than that. But when it's being presented in these ways, how do we sort of tie that in, if at all, do you think, in terms of thinking about how to make sure the approach is intersectional and is, is sort of bringing people along with, with, um, with the analysis as opposed to creating these divides. Do you unmute? Yeah, I've unmuted myself, sorry. It's, oh, I was somehow a bit slow, to, even though once I get going, I talk. But um, I, I think, well, I was going to say one thing before addressing that, which is building on, on Sam's point about talking to each other, which I think is key to the, to the, um, to the question of any sort of conflicts and intergenerational tensions i think that actually understanding each other and talking to each other must be central that sort of um principle of debate and argument is as being the source of knowledge and understanding and i'd also say that solidarity is crucial so the point i made earlier in my introduction about intersectionality being you know actually material fact you know that that class is gendered and and racialized, and that um, you know, in a way, expressing that through solidarity. I mean, for example, the way in which the women against pit closures was key to the struggle for the for the for the jobs in the mines, and for challenging the sort of you know um, Thatcher uh, destruction of the of the mining areas. Okay, they didn't succeed, but they built a fantastic movement which has continued in some ways in those areas um so i think developing that kind of solidarity and knowledge so hearing about salma's struggle around housing and actually housing is a key area where obviously women are kind of going to be at the fore and are most you know directly affected and often are in the leadership of tenants and 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 um housing struggles and and socialist feminists need to be really you know part of that so I think that sort of, I think two principles, one is of open debate and argument and discussion and seeking to understand each other. And secondly, um, uh, solidarity and engagement in each other's struggles. So that intersectionality isn't about identity, it's about material materiality. It's about actually the, the kinds of oppressions that we face, they are intersectional. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a yeah, a really, really important, um, a really important point. I think, Shardine, did you want to add to this? Yes, no, absolutely. So, um, you know, I opened up of my introduction um, with a quote from the Combahee River Collective Statement, and um, that was, like I said, a group of black women that actually created the term identity politics. But I think um, what we need to be um, clear about is identity politics that they were talking about was coming from a socialist material analysis. And um, as, as Hilary already pointed out there as well, um, a kind of what we now call a sort of intersectional approach, like looking at your own identity and experience and then sort of thinking about and working, working out how patriarchy, sexism, capitalism, affect your are your oppression experience i i guess so um i think there needs to be um a definition there i'm quite critical of identity politics but i'm a critical of liberal identity politics which is something very 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 different which doesn't taking um any sort of um a mirror's material analysis when you think like that and is very just focused on an individualist um sense of self and not connecting that to anything else and also um you know from that statement it talks about they created the term identity politics to push back on the left of this idea of the raceless sexless worker worker that um often really is just the, the trope of a, a a white man and you know what's interesting to me and i think something that we also need to sort of challenge is um when we often see these sort of critiques of id poll suddenly when it becomes to talking about white working class men is that not identity politics it is surely 
you know, that ID is okay, that's fine. But then as soon as you start talking about trans people and black women and Asian women or anyone else, that's suddenly identity politics. And I think that's something that those of us on the left, those of us who are feminists or those who just say they're, they're socialists actually really need to address why that is acceptable because it's racist and it's sexist. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is a, a, um, a sort of understanding that you often find um, in parts of the Labour Party and uh, including on, in parts of the left of this idea that um, the Labour Party has lost votes in the past because it's been too concerned with identity politics and therefore losing this core white working class vote. And obviously we know this to be, I mean, I'm sure Belle can speak to this, but it's it, it far, far more complicated. Um, than that analysis really ever allows for um, in, in a number of ways. Um, Iggy, did you want to um, come in on this before we move on to the next question? Yeah, just, just be very quick. I mean, I think we've got so much to learn from all of these particular groups of women. You know, my mum's 91 and she's got stories of what it was like to work in a mill as a from a working class family in the north. And it's like we need to capture some of that because she's her, her family, some of her you know family members is still around and there are communities of people in the north with stories to tell. Now Corbyn, whichever way it is, Corbyn managed to bring that together. You know, my mum adored Corbyn and she hadn't loved Labour politics for a very long time, as she'd say to you. You know, I've lived under a lot of these people and she doesn't, you know, she's got a, some bad words along the way for certain people. But she thought Corbyn, it wasn't just him. It was the way you could, oh, he could open up uh, conversations with depth and with honesty and with integrity. And people wanted to be on board. It was the first time I'd ever known my mum to want to be at a Labour conference. She rejoined the Labour Party and she wanted to be back involved at, at 90, 89, 90 years old. I think we mustn't lose the fact that, you know, there are many, many women of all different groups and all different different identities who have stories to tell and want to tell those stories we need to sort of find ways to go out and have a Jeremy Corbyn moment again they, they haven't gone uh, we just need to find ways to bring them together I think like like he did uh, with his honesty so I think that actually um, allows me to segue quite smoothly into thinking about, I suppose, some of the final questions. And Belle and Jess, I wanted to um, first come to you on this. And really, this question of how we deal with and overcome disagreements within the movement. And I mean, I, I think we can think about the, the feminist movement, the socialist feminist movement, but also, I guess, more broadly, the left or the Labour Party, um, given your um where you both sit and the work that you're both doing. And I guess maybe approach this however you feel um, best, but thinking about some of those intergenerational divides that we've touched on, but also these some of these divides around how people are understanding identity politics and this sort of positioning of the, the, the so-called white working class. How do you best see us overcoming and dealing with some of these disagreements? If Val, I, I come to you and then Jess, um, I'll come to you after if that's all right. Yeah, I, I think we have to, um actually just be willing to ask, answer people's questions. I think one of the biggest criticisms that people have is, um, and I, I don't necessarily believe it's true that, oh, we can't say anything, you know, just like the, all we do is spend our time um, talking about immigration, but, you know, those types of lines. And I think we've been able to get to a place in politics overall where people are really reductionist about all of their arguments. So we're almost as a society taught to aspire to less. So I think about um, a lot of the things that were asked for uh, or a lot of our policies at the last general election and people were saying that it wasn't achievable and that, you know, it wasn't realistic and we shouldn't be able to do this and we shouldn't be able to do that. But we, we can see that all of these things are absolutely achievable and, and people are allow themselves to go down to those very, very reductionist um, ideas where people start fighting over um, what should be prioritised because they don't believe that we can actually prioritise everybody. And I think that's really sad. And it's really sad that we've got to a place where we've been able to, with all of the wealth in particular that we have in this country, get people to a place where they think 
that we cannot we cannot have all of these things. We cannot have enough for everybody. So I think it's just it's just showing people that actually all of this the, these ideas, you know, this war on this war on woke is is unnecessary. It's all a lie. You can uh, you know protect people um, of of certain characteristics whilst at the same time protecting people that don't um, fit into those into those, those characteristics. And actually, when I think about these arguments about uh, the white working class uh, versus everybody else. I think about who makes up the white working class. The majority of the white working class are women. The majority um, um, are women and disabled people. The majority are women, disabled people and LGBT people. So actually um, this so-called group of, of, of you know white uh, men who are apparently being completely disadvantaged when we talk about all of these subjects don't even necessarily make up the majority. So the idea that we are disadvantaging them in, in, in somehow by talking about, you know, protecting women, protecting disabled people, protecting LGBTQ people, protecting um, BAME people in different different sectors it, is taking away from that. We need to we need to hit that head on and not actually be willing to fall into those arguments because we think it's going to help us win elections. Yeah, thank you for that, Belle. I think that this is a, that that this important. This is an important point about who constitutes the working class, who constitutes the so-called white working class. And I think it also should sort of force us to question how are we understanding this term working class and who sort of not only who falls into it, but often in sort of popular discourse, the categories that are being used are really outdated based on sort of market research um, categories that really don't match up to people's lived experience of um, the, the kinds of the way that people are navigating and having to experience the economy really doesn't match up to this quite outdated um, definition of class, which I think sort of dovetails quite nicely with what Jess was talking about before in terms of her experiences working in um, retail. And Jess, just as, as uh, given um, your role in Young Labour, like, I was wondering if you could also maybe speak to this, but also thinking about some of these um, intergenerational divides, how much of this do you see this being an issue? How do you see this sort of manifesting? And is there, what are the ways to overcome these sort of um, ruptures that we sometimes see? Yeah, it's such a huge question. And I, I, I think we are obviously the wrong way at the moment. And, you know, we're viewing our target voters or, you know, so-called target voters um, according to the leadership, is sort of like they've compartmentalised this uh, to be working class and, you know, what's the average person in Stoke going to think? Um, and it just completely reduces the experience of, of millions of working class people um, to something that doesn't exist anymore. You know, we, we have a very clear like line between um, certain areas of what certain people's experiences are. You know, if you're looking at younger generations, you, you've got thousands and thousands of young people who like, you know, um, are currently employed in precarious work will probably never own uh, their own house and so when you've got a uh, labor party kind of targeting like homeowners as like a um cohort to target i just think it's quite reductive and and not effective as a strategy because it doesn't understand the complexities of living um, and the experiences of so many working class people and 20 you know it is evidence that people did vote for change believe in hope and they did support policies which were largely intersectional and didn't accept the status quo um, and so I think to throw all of that out um, for some kind of outdated system that there is no evidence you know is going to be effective anymore um, just just feels really 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 silly um, but in terms of like you know how we find our way through disagreements um, obviously I think it's important that we have a space for from which we discuss these things. And as we've seen, you know, down of discussion ALPs um, really hasn't helped the situation um, and has actually further divided relationships in the party um, and led to a lot of people feeling completely disengaged by our movement, which would never ever be the aim of the Labour Party. Um, and so I think, you know, when there's issues around identity, it, it comes down to much greater education of our own activists. And, um, making sure that we equip them with the skills to identify when reactionary narratives are being perpetuated. Because I think the problem that we obviously have at the moment with um, the narratives being created, particularly around trans women, is that actually, you know, th these, you know, anti-trans, um, like activists, they would probably call themselves, um, have found a way to kind of exploit our willingness to have that discussion um, and and our you know 
making the argument and uh, like to say, oh, well, we just want to, we just want to talk about, it. we just want to ask these questions. But often, if you delve into it, this is part of the the campaign of pushing and pushing and pushing uh, this this narrative about about trans women being a threat to women's spaces and all that awful transphobic content that they come out with once they're in that space. So I do think you know having a space for discussion around politics is important but it's really important that that doesn't um, put other people at risk and allow people to perpetuate really dangerous narratives because i think that is something that we are really struggling with at the moment um, as a movement yeah and i mean i think this is a theme that we've um touched on a lot tonight and necessarily so and something that certainly where um i think a lot more work is being done and needs to continue being done um Salma, did you want to um, come in on this? Yes, I, I just wanted to um, come in on the disagreement within the movement side of things. Um, it it's, makes me quite sad about that, actually, uh, because, uh, you know, we, we, we should, you know, we've got a got a huge task ahead of us, you know, uh, uh in terms of equality in, in terms of you know racism and in, in in terms of the whole feminism agenda uh, uh and the left agenda socialist agenda but uh but uh you know we we have these conflicts we de we have these challenges because each of us each of, of our movement you know we have uh, uh, um, we have this personal personal agenda. Of course, we do. Each of us, we have personal agenda. But we we also have something common, you know, something common because we we want to see a better world. We want to see a socialist world. We want to see more equal society, you know. And and that's what drives me, you know. Drives me it, it is about uh, about you know. Uh, uh, making a difference, and 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 one of my motto is, is is if it's wrong, change it. So you know we have this commonality, and on all we need to do is put away our sort of personal agenda and personal you know uh, issues, and and work within the common common things that we have. Uh, we have to, you know. I'm sorry, you know, we haven't got choice. You know the way the way the world is operating at the moment, after austerity, after COVID, and after you know uh, uh, the way our own party operating, you know, uh, uh, Labour Party I'm talking about, and uh, and uh, you know we have something big at stake, and and we 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 have to overcome our differences. You know, like you know, uh, you have to overcome the differences that that we as uh, you know. Muslim and mainstream society has and and work with you know what we have in common and then the common is 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 a better world common is you know a, a, a world that we want uh, uh, to live safe a, a world that I want my daughter you know not to face Islamophobia for example and 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 my son not to you know be judged by his beard. And so, uh, you know, and this is what is at stake. And, and this is why we must overcome all these differences and then we must work together, you know, and, and, and really upsets me when, when I see these, these, uh, these uh, you know, conflicts happening and we forgetting what's at stake. Yeah, thank you. It's true. It is important to center. Yeah, what, exactly what you said, what is at stake? Um, Iggy? Um, okay, I'll be very quick. I mean, I just wanted to say, you know, we're not demographics. You know, I am not a demographic. When I write down that I'm disabled, I am disabled. When I write down I am non-binary, that is who I am. The fear about identity politics is because we've got nobody bloody well standing up for us. I want a leader of a party who stands up for people and and is 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 has got the strength of mind to turn around to say 
I stand for people with disability, LGBT people, black women, black men, people who are of different faiths, and to stand up and to finally say, I want us all to support people from all communities. Fear is brought about because people will not stand up and say what they should say on our behalf. I am not a demographic, neither are you. We are people and we all deserve a livable life and we want somebody to stand up and bloody well say it that's it that's all i want to say no yeah thank you i mean yeah politics by um focus group is not going to get you anywhere so yeah 100 percent with you on that um hillary just come to you you're muted absence of such a leader and i'm not sure that we'll get one very quickly like that um i think that we need to do more together ourselves so i would really say why don't we once we can all meet and it's legal to be convivial and to debate and to argue in person why don't we create some kind of socialist feminist space where we can have these discussions in a spirit of mutual respect and 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 recognition and uh, and trying to understand each other uh it, you know in in order to build a stronger movement i just think we need that space for for sensitive discussions and uh, and joint actions and we won't we can't wait for the leader that we'd all like <laughs> yeah yeah a really important point and as nice as it is to be able to work from home in my pajamas uh, being able to meet and do uh, yeah, the kind of organising that you're talking about, I think, is, is really essential. And Shardine, I'll just come to you last. Yeah, I just wanted to make a really brief point as well on this um, in terms of the intergenerational divide. And I think particularly in the left, um, we do need to address um, how um, some of those in our movement are actually now in positions of power and they're acting as gatekeepers to... Um, younger feminists and perpetuating um, anti-trans rhetoric in quite a few of our left spaces and um, I think that's something that this whatever this new socialist feminist movement that we're trying to build here needs to address and we need to think about what happens when we ourselves start to sort of move up into you know certain trade union positions or within the Labour Party and how we don't actually mentor and support younger feminists in our movement with new ideas or with things which you might feel uncomfortable about and actually just be open into the sort of learning from younger people. So I think we shouldn't be frightened to address that gatekeeping and actually call it out for what it is because otherwise it will just stifle whatever movement we're going to build. Yeah, thank you um, for that, Shardine, and thank you to all of the speakers. We are uh, run out of time, even though I think that this, yeah, the, I would love to hear you sort of weigh in on um, all these issues for much, much longer. And perhaps the, the the work to be done is exactly what Hillary was saying: creating a space for us to actually meet in person um, and do this kind of work. Um, but thank you all so much for taking part in this discussion, and I think. So much has come out of it tonight, not least the real need for what an inclusive feminism will actually mean, which is ensuring that is is transit it, inclusive of trans people, inclusive inclusive thinking about racism and anti-racism, inclusive of migrant women, and making sure that really, really we don't marginalize the people who are so often um marginalized in mainstream and also parts of left feminism. But just before I go, I wanted to very, very quickly call attention to an event that is happening next week at the start of the session I mentioned, and um, the domestic abuse bill that is currently moving through parliament, but that excludes migrant women who are often left shut out from domestic refuges because of um, their immigration status. And so the link to the event should be put in the comments um, and yeah, it would be great to see as many of you there as possible, where you'll hear about how migrant women are being excluded from the domestic abuse bill, but also really, really importantly, what you can do to change that, because there is still the potential for this to change. And so we really, really need people to get behind and support that. So I hope that um, you're able to sign up to that event. And thank you very much for, um, for, for, yeah, for joining this, what I think was a really, really important event. And I think now I'll, I'm handing over to Deborah. I believe to close.
Thanks, Mona. Um, and thanks so much uh, for guiding us through this event. Really, really, really great to have you doing that. Um, and I just wanted to do a quick shout out to um, my book, Hostile Environment, How Immigrants Became Scapegoats, um, which I would really, really recommend everyone here reading. Um, just to say, yeah, my name is Deborah. Um, I sit in the National Coordinating Group for Momentum. And I have to say, uh, watching this event has made me feel really, really proud to be a Momentum member um, and that we're hosting this discussion. And I'm really, really thankful to the speakers. And this is very much meant to be the start of something, um, not the end, not just a sort of one-off International Women's Day event. Um, what we want to do, and we hope you're going to get involved with it, is over the coming months, we want to collaborate with campaigners, activists, trade unionists from across the movement and run a series of events, of conversations about the future of the women's movement, the feminist movement, and how it can be inclusive, class conscious, um, and yeah, how we can build a socialist feminism in the 21st century. There's an email that should have been posted um, in, the, in the chat um, if you wanted to get sort of more involved with that. And, and yeah, we'd love to have your input and look out for future events. And as well as that, um, the other really important thing that is happening is in June um, is Labour Women's Conference. And for the first time in decades, um, we'll have a chance of electing a women's committee. Um, we are backing four fantastic candidates. One of them you heard tonight, Solma. And we're also backing Aqua, Trisha and Chloe. And you can sort of find all of the information about that on the website. And if you can go, if you're still in Labour Party, if you can go and sort of uh, nominate those candidates and get yourself elected as a delegate, that would be really great. And then finally, today has been a really, really big day for Momentum. Today we launched our organisational strategy for, the, for socialist organising in a new era. Um, our plan for between now and 2024. Um, it's very much a document uh, for discussion. Um, we really, really want everyone to read it, uh, discuss it, critique it, um, and engage with it. And so, yeah, I think a link should be posted in the chat now, and I'd really, really encourage you um, to click on that. And tonight, you know, with your after your dinner, have a read. And, yeah, thank you so much all for coming. Solidarity, and see you soon. <laughs>